What's up, BMS? This is going to be part one of human impact. Here we go. Today, we're going to be talking about human impact. Okay, so like Mr. Cook, like he said in earlier in the week, uh, if you want to go back, go back to Google Classroom or hit up his YouTube page, Mr. Cook, and uh, go watch that. He talked about this right here. What is causing global temperatures um, to rise and how has it affected climate so over a long period of time? So he discussed this in detail and showed you some really good graphs on carbon dioxide and, and asked some good scientific questions. Um, so uh, just to kind of go off of where he left off, uh, he showed you this graph at the very end and talked about how this part right here Okay, where I have my arrow, um, that represents this entire line from the end of the red down here by a thousand. It's the years all the way up to where we are now. Okay, a little bit before where we are now. And it talked about how uh, carbon dioxide, really, the levels begin to decrease after the Industrial Revolution. So that was one of the answers to the questions that you asked. Could it have been something that man has done in the past and now to raise those levels of carbon dioxide? Because what we saw from thousands and thousands of years before this is that it was a cycle. It was up, went down, up, down, up, down, about this, you know, cycle for however many years. But when it hit this point, the Industrial Revolution, it started to spike and increase. So today we're going to be talking about uh the how part okay man-made and we're not just going to be talking about carbon dioxide we'll talk a little bit about it but we're going to talk about human impact in general terms and what does that mean okay so human impact what is human impact so you can read along to be able to survive um to be able to survive we create and use things in the process, we can directly or indirectly impact the earth. Sometimes our actions can negatively affect the environment we live in. These things can be as simple as leaving the shower running while brushing your teeth or making the decision to throw your paper away in the recycling bin. So human impact is exactly what it says. The impact that we have had on the environment. What do we do? Okay, and we live in a fast, fast-paced society here in America. And to live in that fast-paced society... We want things accessible, and so that means easy to use. But what we don't think about a lot is how we impact the environment. So, moving on, we're going to talk about a lot of things to discuss in a very short time, so listen fast. Water usage, land usage, and pollution, okay, which is like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which I'm sure you've seen YouTube videos and articles on that. Huge topic. Um, there's even... Uh, I mean, there's tons of videos you can go and look, pictures. Uh, but anyway, so that'll, we'll cover that under pollution. So let's talk about water usage real quick. Okay, so we know since we've done uh, the unit on the water cycle is that water is a cycle, okay? That it's always going to be, uh, in a sense, restored, right? Okay, it's never going to be lost. It's just going to turn into a different form. Uh, and talking about states of matter, okay? So we know the water cycle, evaporation, condensation, cloud formation, precipitation, crystallization, okay? Then it hits the ground as runoff and can transpire or, or seep into the ground. So there's water everywhere, okay? But humans use water, okay? And, and what we think is that there is an abundance of water, but really... Less than 1% is available for human use. So what does that mean? The rest is either salt water found in oceans, fresh water frozen in the polar ice caps, or too inaccessible for practical use. So it might be something like too deep underground to be able to use. You don't have a well driller that drills that deep enough. So it's just 99% of the water is inaccessible to us. So we're using the 1%, even though it's still a lot of water, Okay, talking about in terms of one person, but the world is big. There's lots of people, and we have to have water. So a lot of times we're not very conscious about how much we use. 
While population demand on freshwater resources are increasing, supply will always remain this, the same. But if our demand increases, but the supply stays the same, okay, you're going to start talking about a lot more, probably even in your social studies classes, in the next few grades, and in science, when you talk about resources, supply and demand, okay? If you have an enormous of supply of something, but the demand is not so great, usually prices are going to drop. That's why we see gas prices the way they are now. Lots of supply, not as much demand because people aren't traveling as much. But once demand goes high, supply goes down, you usually see like prices increase. Well, the thing about water, okay, if the supply remains the same, okay, but usage increases, so the demand increases, get, guess what? There's going to be more people using it, but the same amount. Okay, it's not going to be replenished uh, fast enough. So, that's how we use water. All right, so how do we? Withdrawal. Dams and levees, pumps and wells. So, that's taking it from the source, withdrawing it. Irrigation for agriculture. Okay, big part of it's irrigation. Uh, even animals, okay, need it. And um, But crops that we eat the food have to have water also. Okay, water sanitation for daily use, like drinking and bathing. So, like our cities, we're fortunate here in America to have wonderful clean water, but not everybody does. Okay, we have a specific um, area in the utilities department in our city that cleans our water so that we can even have safe drinking water and safe water to take a shower in. Or if you want to drink out of the tap water, not bad. Recreation, we use water for recreation. Producing power and electricity, that's hydroelectricity. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. So that's how we use a lot of our water. What are issues that come from that? 97% salt, salt water. Uh, so it's your ocean water. Okay, three-fourths of fresh water is ice. That's what we were talking about earlier. A lot of the water that is there is inaccessible. The rest is mostly ground, uh, in the ground, not enough in a given place in time. Water shortages. We don't see this much because we live in a place where there's not much water shortage. But there are many places, third world countries, that's not far from us that have water shortages. Uh, that's when we take more than the cycle can replenish. Structures change habitat. When we build things like that, limits migration, spawning, and nutrient growth, which the water actually needs to stay healthy. Okay, irrigation, irrigating of the crops, can lead to losing water through transpiration, okay? There's not enough plants, okay? Or when you irrigate crops, you're losing that water up into the atmosphere, which can cause, uh, it has to make the cycle over again, okay? And that water is going to move somewhere depending on when the wind blows. 2.3 billion people don't have basic sanitation facilities, resources, and the money. That's a lot of people. We don't realize that, okay? The last one. I think it says deforestation, um, increase erosion, silt runoff into available water. So deforestation is like when we go through and build, um, like let's say a city, township, or whatever it might be, we take that land and we strip it, okay? It might even be strip mining, which I'll talk about that a little bit. But there's no ve vegetation to keep that ground in place, so all of that is going to run downhill due to gravity, and that's what we call silt runoff, and it goes into good water, and really it makes it unsanitary. So, that's our issues with using the water and how we've come to use it. Now, let's talk about land. So, we use land. You have to have land, okay, um, to do anything with, okay? So, you're talking about how do we use it? Crops for food, okay? Got to have big chunks of land when you open an airplane. You see those big plots of lands that look like big rectangles or squares flying over Arkansas or the Midwest, wherever you are. Those are crops. That's a lot of land being used for that. Land to raise animals for other purposes. Okay, meat, uh, whatever it might be. Okay, um, shelter. Got to have houses and apartments. Towns and cities. Okay, development. Things like that. Transportation, strip mining for minerals. This picture down here to the left of me um, 
it's a strip mining a piece of land where they went through mine the minerals and then there's nothing usually else to do with that land and that land is just wasted okay and then what we were talking about earlier silt runoff which can uh, damage the water okay so issues because of land use interferes with the ecosystem affects wildlife habitat increases soil erosion and sediment runoff um, land dries out and remains barren for years uh, it's just that's the dust bowl that's exactly why the dust bowl happened go go look up the dust bowl nutrient depletion soil becomes less fertile longer the longer crops are grown okay the same thing over and over and over again actually cool fact in biblical times the seventh year okay if you go back like through the hebrew bible history little history lesson here they would actually take off every seventh year okay kind of like we do like sabbath on sundays take off every seven year and allow the land to rest and grow up okay and start you know replenishing the new nutrients because we don't do that now and what's happened is the depletion the land the more we use it over and over and over again every year becomes less fertile okay that's what's known as de uh desertification becomes like a desert dust bowl that's what happens